All right, let's try this, all right? I was gonna zoom in on the sea lions, let you guys watch those guys. I'm sure a handful of people around the world are gonna find this interesting. Other people might find it annoying. <laughs> but uh, I can see the screen a lot better right here below me, and I'll see if I can, I can get a good handful of emails shared this way, and then I'm gonna take off. You can hear those, the sea lion sounds. Those are like very, very big animals, right? And those sounds don't vibrate your your ribs. So you imagine what it takes to uh, to vibrate the ribs and the bodies of people from sound. It's got to be something else, right? To hear those, to hear those uh, those screams, those roars, something nobody'd ever crave, I'm sure. All right, now listen to this. Walnut Creek. Hi Steve, just a small story for the collection. Names were changed. My sister Jean and I have been learning truths about this world we live in for over four years. I'm watching you for about two years. Although we've never had a personal Sasquatch experience, we trust those good, hardworking people who have had experiences and are suffering those who don't believe. We recently met up with our brother David, his wife and our youngest brother Norman to camp out on a 60 acre undeveloped property David and his wife had just purchased, located in central Texas. My sister and I have been talking to both our brothers about these truths we're learning and have woken them up to a lot of them. We had a very little of the evening around the campfire, eating, drinking, and conversing. David told us about structures and brief sightings of an unidentified black something from a distance. When we get on the subject of Sasquatch, Norman would smile and roll his eyes frequently. Later on, we each retired to our beds. David and wife to an RV, myself and my sister to a camper, and Norman slept outside in the open bed of his truck in the middle of the nearby field. The next morning when Norman woke up, he wanted to know who got up in the night and looked over the side of the bed of the truck at him. It was dark and he didn't have on his glasses, so he only saw the outline of head and shoulders. I know this disturbed him because no matter how much we all denied having been over to his truck, he just kept asking. I went over to the truck to look for any tracks and didn't find any. It was at that time I realized that even my six-foot brother would have had to stand on his tiptoes just to be able to see him in the bed of his large truck. The only part that would have been seen by Norman would be the top of the head and eyes. My sister and I are over 60 years old. My brothers are both closing in on 60. The older we get, the closer we become. Gene and I don't mind the ribbing by Norman, we just want them to start to learn the truth about these beings, so if they ever see one, it will not be a complete shock to reality. We have referred both brothers to your YouTube channel, but they are both pretty stubborn. They won't admit to having checked it out. Oh well, at least if they have one encounter, they'll immediately know that they are not alone. I would not mind sharing my name, but I don't believe my brothers would like to be out at this point, so just call me Gail. Thanks for all the truth spread and the matter-of-fact way you present it. Our love and prayers are always being sent to you and Sarah. And I absolutely appreciate that. That is so kind. Thank you. Thank you for the share. And trust me, your, uh, your family that doesn't want to admit to watching this channel, they are not alone. I can only imagine how many people watch this channel would never admit to it. There's going to be probably thousands. These email shares are way back from my uh, March folder to or April folder too. Sasquatch on the east coast of the US. Dear Steve, I think you'd be happy to see that I use punctuation. Okay, here we go. Let's see how you made out. I grew up in the western lakes and mountains region of the beautiful state of Maine. The woods, hills, lakes, and meadows are my playground. There are several paper mills, logging operations, and a granite quarry here. It's the perfect habitat for Sasquatch to hide out. My uncle was a heavy equipment operator for a construction company that built bridges, roads, etc. all over western and central Maine. He was a straight shooter and sharp as a tack until his death in 2019. Well, when I was in the fifth, fourth or fifth grade, 76 or 77, he told me about a Bigfoot sighting he had in the little nearby town of Canton. While visiting him before he passed in 2019, I asked him if he remembered telling me about it, and he certainly did remember. He said that he was on his way to work very early in the morning when he saw a huge, dark, hairy, upright being appear on the right side of the road. He said that it took one leap into the middle of the road and in front of him, and then another leap into the ditch on the left side of the road and disappeared into the woods. 
Again, my uncle was a well-respected, trustworthy man, and I've believed him all these years. Please do not read my name. Sincerely. <laughs> okay, I won't. P.S. The following comment is in response to your message from yesterday stating that 1978 emails have been read since December. You're awesome, Steve. I've been following you for years from Maine. Keep kicking the lion, being evil Bigfoot research bastards in the teeth with your constant flow of truth bombs and revelations from the good people out there. I love it. I believe that one day the lamestream media will have to acknowledge the truth about these beings. All right. Thanks for that email. Thanks for the share. And I don't think we need anybody to acknowledge at this point. There's far too many people that have seen it. Everybody's sticking together. It's all about the people, and that's what matters, right? And that's what's working. Hearing from the people. And there's no other way to do it that I know of. My encounter. 19th, 2018, I was bass fishing, bass fishing in a place called Camel Slough, which is part of a bigger lake named Saline Lake in Deville, Louisiana. I fished this lake off and on my whole life since I grew up in the area. That morning I fished a few places, but eventually came back to the slough because I've always had good luck there. I had entered the slough on the right side and fished all the way down into the back channel, and then came back up the left side around this old cypress tree on the corner, which has a platform built on it from old duck hunters. I made a loop around the tree, casting in various spots, and then continued down the bank toward this old T-shaped dock, which has been there for years as well. Behind the dock, there's an old abandoned camp, which sets about 60 yards back in the trees. As I neared the right side of the T-shaped dock, I looked down to adjust my foot on the trolling motor pedal so to angle around the dock as I made one last cast at the inside corner. When suddenly I hear a loud splash to my left side on the other side of the dock. My initial thought was gator, but to my surprise, as I look over, I see a five foot tall bipedal run out of the water up the slight embankment into the trees to the left of the camp. For a second I was stunned, but then quickly my brain rushed and said, wait, what if there's more a possibility a bigger one still in the water waiting to grab me off this boat? So I threw my pole in the bottom of the boat, kicked my tackle box out of the way and cranked the boat just as he was disappearing into the trees. I hauled ass back to the boat dock where I fished for another ha ha hour or two in sight of other people before I left. But I note that as it ran uphill, it slipped. And when it did, it reached down with its right hand to balance itself to get its footing. I got a very good look at its hand when it reached and noticed it was human looking as mine, except for the back hand was hairy as the rest of its body. However, its fingers and palm were like mine, except a few shades darker. Its fur appeared to be three inches long. It was wet from the neck down. The body just looked black from being wet, but the neck and head was dry and very cinnamon color. I don't recall seeing a face, but because its body was wet, I could see it wasn't super muscular. It had the build of a high school athlete, but not huge. I assume its hair had been dry. It would have been a lot thicker looking of a build, but wet is how I seen it. I would say the entire sighting lasted roughly five seconds from slash, from splash to disappearance. I've not been back to this spot since. I kicked myself for not getting the prints off the bank, but I was scared shitless at the time. Since then, I've moved from there and have no access to do no. Since then, I moved from there and have no access to do further research. I've honestly, I've honestly only told a few people until now for fear that someone would try to hunt and possibly kill it. But after three years, I'd say it's time to speak for my research purposes. This is my story. I'm my Google Maps location history can verify my location and my abrupt leaving the location at exactly 10.04 a.m. From there it shows me hauling ass back to the ramp where I fished a bit more before leaving for the house, still weirded out by the sighting. I know what I've seen was a Sasquatch, or aka Australopithecus. <laughs> Australopithecus. My ultimate question is, what was it doing in the water? Did I sneak up on it as I was bathing? or? Had I swam the other side and crossed as I was coming down the bank? Was it rushing to reach the bank before I got there or merely playing in the water? If it was swimming, it was the quietest swimmer ever. Or it was waiting on me and my sudden shift and boat maneuver scared it into running? I believe it to be a juvenile, one compared to stories I've heard about the eight footers. I've heard stories about boaters going missing and it really makes me think, hmm, boaters going missing, no shit.
I often think about it and what its true intentions were in the water the day before I scared it off. I often think about it and what its true intentions were in the water that day before I scared it off. Below included coordinates, signed the Squatcher. <laughs> wow. That's definitely going to be an eye opener when you're uh, when you're fishing and relaxed and having the time of your life in the middle of the day and to see something like that running out of the water. No thanks. All right. All right. Here comes another one. Morning, Steve. I've been following your channel for a while. I'm a Native American. My family used to practice the sun dance in and around Mount Hood. When you're coming down the mountain, the engine light came on. We pulled to the side, we found enough room to and popped the hood. Just then, my kid brother started crying. He's about four years old. That's when my dad and I heard the gargling. It was very clear sounds of gargling, except loud and close by. We looked at each other and said, what's that? We didn't stick around much longer and figured to look at the car in the next town. Thinking of that time now, maybe the big guy was answering my kid's brother's crying. Or, do you know of any animals that gargle? Well, my story of, who knows what we heard, Tim Octuck. Gargling, I don't know, man. I haven't a clue about the gargling sounds. I'm sure somebody's probably heard it. I haven't. Sounds uh, a little interesting. All right, I'm just ripping along here because I got to get out of here. I'm going to be late. Sarah and the kids are coming out. I got to take everybody out in the water. Anyway. Arkansas Bigfoot Encounter. Hey Steve, I honestly don't use my first name, which is also Steve. I've got an encounter to share with you and your listeners. It's probably not as interesting as most encounters you read, but it was real and very intense for me, even if no one believes me. It happened in September 2012 in central Arkansas. It was a month before archery deer season, whitetail, and I was out scouting and checking game cameras. Things started out normally. I made my way from camera to camera and looking for deer sign. The land I hunt is private and barely under 200 acres. Only myself and two of my grown sons hunt on this land, but more times than not, it's just me. I'd say the biggest part of the land is loblolly lob -lob pine, open timber in places and super thick underbrush in others. There are four pastures and there's a section of huge open hardwoods, mostly giant white oaks and fruit, some of the largest acorns I've ever seen. Mostly mostly giant white oaks that fruit some of the largest acorns I've ever seen. The hardwoods are where I started. There are cattle on the land, so tons of cow trails that I walk looking for deer tracks as they walk these trails sometimes too. I made my way out of the hardwoods and walked one edge of the pasture until I hit the section of open pines. Most of these pines are good straight telephone pole quality trees, great for climbing stands. Eventually the underbrush starts getting thicker and thicker. And if you aren't on a cow slash game trail, it can be difficult to make much headway. As you go even further into the thickets, the bigger pines are more spread out and there are tons of different sized saplings of a large variety of trees, mostly sweet gum or golden amber trees. I would say the average thickness of these sweet gums at head level would be about the diameter of a Louisville slugger. As I started getting close to this area, I felt what many have sent in their encounters have said, I felt a sense of dread, like I was being hunted or stalked. My mind immediately went black bear. Through the years we've seen a few. Then I thought about coyotes, but they would most likely be rabbit to consider attacking an adult. Those thoughts came and went literally in a second or two. I immediately knew it was something else. I didn't want to give in and accept what I was thinking could be. I was frozen in fear. I felt I should head to the truck and leave, but I still have a few more cameras to check. I now stood there for no less than five minutes. I finally told myself to get a grip before I had a heart attack as my heart was beating out of my chest. It was then I started noticing several of the baseball bat diameter trees that were broken over. I would estimate the breaks were around 10 feet up the trees. I also noticed that the tops were broken over, all pointed at me, and they made a half a circle in front of me. Okay, so now I'm legitimately freaked out. I'm seriously waiting for the heart attack. The sense of dread is now completely overwhelming and even though I grew up hunting these woods, I found myself completely disoriented. 
I soon realized that I was on a cow slash game trail. I also realized that either way, I go on this trail that I'll come out in one of the pastures. And I had to clear and I had the clarity to know where I was. I could just make it to any of these pastures and would know what direction to go. As I contemplated whether to go forward or turn around and go the other way, I heard something that jarred my whole system. Immediately after hearing the sound, I had clarity. The dread completely disappeared and curiosity took over. That's kind of weird. What I heard was a child crying. Not a baby necessarily, but a toddler maybe. Any feeling of fear was gone. Now it's just curiosity and concern about this kid that must be lost in the woods. I'm guessing the cries are maybe 50 yards ahead and I take a few steps. The woods in front of me exploded with snapping limbs and timber shaking and holy crap, something is coming my way. Suddenly there he was. The cause of dread and fear was standing right in front of me. I say he because trust me, there was no doubt. There was no doubt about his manhood. I have to say that for the most part, most descriptions fit perfectly with this dude. He had to be a four foot shoulder span, legs at least as big around as my torso. I'm 5'8", 220 pounds. Definitely a body rippling with noticeable muscles, but no six pack abs. In fact, I'd say he had a bit of a belly. Jet black, shiny hair all over, except what skin you can see on a bearded man's face. The hair seemed to be less dense on his feet and the top of his hands. His skin color reminded me of the color of a charcoal gray pencil. Not the skin color of a black man or any other race I've ever seen. Dark charcoal, charcoal gray is the best I can describe it. My house has eight foot ceilings and he was easily that tall if not a little more than that. Okay, so this is my take on what I saw and what I didn't see. What I saw was a massive man. This was no ape. No half ape slash half man. There is absolutely no doubt. I'll even say this. He is actually a fairly good looking man. And yeah, not really a noticeable neck. I never noticed any odor. Enough of the description back of the story. So he has just ran up and stopped right in front of me, 10 yards max. So we eye one, a, one another for maybe five seconds and then he slowly turns and looks behind him. Holy crap, there is another one. I'm guessing six foot six, noticeably smaller than he was. This one was about 20 yards farther behind him, and although I'm not positive, I'm guessing it was female. Female. I say this because although I never saw a juvenile with it, the crying I had heard had completely stopped, and I'm pretty sure this was mom walking away with a toddler. As soon as she started to take off, the big boy looked back at me. He then raised his arm and pointed, not at me, but as to say, but it is if to say, I need to leave. I know that's what he was telling me. As I walked away, my surroundings started becoming familiar again. At this point, I wasn't scared as much as I was just uneasy. I made it to my truck and headed home. I didn't sleep at all that night. This is the first I've spoken about it. Wow. I know it sounds stupid, but I always felt if I said anything, he'd know. And somehow, I'd have to answer for saying something. Even as I tell this, the hair on my neck is standing up. I really think he knows. I still hunt there, but not nearly as much as I used to. I definitely avoid that section of woods. I've been within a hundred yards or so, but I feel I shouldn't go any closer. Although I'm sure they aren't always in that one little section. I feel like it's off limits to me. I've never seen a Bigfoot track out there. I've found broken trees since, but I haven't felt they were in the area of those times but I haven't felt they were in the area at those times. Well, the one I'm sure was a female was more of a dark, rich brown color than black. I couldn't make out too many details or features on that one except for the height and color differences. Again, I never could make out the, the one that was crying. I completely believe they're another race of people. The whole sixth sense you talk about, I fully believe you're right. After experiencing those feelings, even before I saw him, they can tap into something we can't and bring feelings of fear and dread and disorientation. It has to be their first line of defense. I can say that I wouldn't mind seeing one again, but from like a hundred yards away and it not being pissed off. I sure didn't get that warm and fuzzy vibe from him. Please use my first name only. Thanks. Harmon. Wow. You know, it's been a handful of people 
email in that exact experience of having a large male man-like being, hair-covered human-like being, uh, pointing to leave or waving your arm to leave or looking at people with absolute intense stare while the other ones walk away. And then he looks back at them, makes sure they're gone, gives another dirty look and then leaves with them. What an amazing freaking thing to see. Thanks for sending that in, man. That's funny. I've heard a, a, a couple other people have emailed in and said they feel like uh, they know, the beings know if, if they told somebody about their experience. That sounds pretty bizarre, doesn't it? Wow. You definitely put me there in that story. I was picturing the whole thing as it went down, what you experienced. No thanks. Not for me. So when I'm kind of, I'm finding it kind of hard to relax. I got my back to the rocks, and I'm, I've got my stern rope tied into a clump of kelp, holding me there. So, and I'm by myself. So, um, you, I can't fully concentrate on what I'm. Part of me is focused on behind me, waiting to hear that rock bounce off the hull or something. If I'm screwing up, so I'm not paying attention, right? But, and then I got all the sounds of nature behind me. I hope I'm reading this smooth enough. I'm gonna keep on. Uh, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep sharing while I'm here. At least a couple more. I hope the background's kind of cool for everybody. Not annoying. I guess I'll find out when I see it on the edit program. The pieces of my puzzle. Hi, Mr. Steve. Mike here from Ontario, Canada. When I was a kid, we were exploring the forest near large hydro towers lines near a small town. Three of us. We we're about two kilometers from town in the snow. Out of nowhere, my friend said that we should get be going. I replied, why? My friend said, see these tracks? Only Bigfoot can do that, he explained. The tracks were strangely about a six foot span in between left to right steps and in a straight line. Every time I think of that day, I remember his words seemed quite deep and profound. I wondered how he knew this. Puzzle piece two. Early 2012, I had a dream. I was on my five day a week daily run as a driver that I'm still doing today. In the dream, I saw a beast along my route in a field sitting near a fence. In the dream, as I passed the beast, I turned to get a better look at it. I turned to get a better look, and it appeared to have a long neck like a giraffe. It's at that time, and still am going through a bad time in my life. One day while driving, I called out to God and said, Lord, show thyself to me. While on my route, the very next day, in the very same spot that I dreamt about, I saw a creature. The being appeared to be sitting in the farmer's field with his head down facing me. The traffic was heavy and not fast. As I drove at maybe 50 feet, I fixated my eyes on the beast and turned my head to keep watching. Very wide at the shoulders, fine hair on its back and longer hair on its shoulder fronts. The creature definitely appeared to have a short neck. As it sat there with its head down, as I viewed it, I remember seeing in my mind, Pigfoot is real. So my next thoughts were, I had asked the Lord to show thyself to me, and now I thought, has he? In the scriptures, I believe Paul said he was caught up to the third heavens and saw things unspeakable. What did that? What did he mean? For a while, I believed this was my Savior revealing himself to me physically. Nevertheless, I found your sight, and I do not believe by chance, Dave, and Scott as well. Nevertheless, I found your sight, and I, and I do not believe by chance, Dave, and Scott as well. Thanks for all you're doing. Still waiting for more pieces to my puzzle. You're provided well, Mike T. Mike, that is quite the frickin' experience, right? <laughs> I don't think too many people have asked the Lord to show themselves and had a Sasquatch sighting the next day. That's pretty crazy. It didn't touch the dogs. This happened in the mountains near San Bernardino, too. San Bernardino. Aloha again, Steve. Use my name, it's Chris Miranda. Damn those who are bothered by it. Let's jump right into this. Sasquatch has haunted me since I was 15 years old. They would leave, they wouldn't leave our family alone. The creepiest feeling we ever got from these things started when a huge Sasquatch would stare at us four boys. My brothers and I, when we were trying to sleep at night, the bottom of our bedroom window was about eight feet off the ground and two feet tall. That made the top of the window 10 feet off the ground. It's so high because we live in a mobile home that is three feet off the ground itself. 
Steve, this thing had to lean over to see us through the window. It scared us to death. But the worst part was the glowing eyes. We called them demon eyes. I still feel that way because that beast and its eyes haunt my dreams to this day and I'm 50. Anyways, the first time I seen a Sasquatch, I was at my best friend Scott's house. His little brother Brian was tossing small rocks towards me and I was hitting them the way you would a baseball. But instead of using a wooden baseball bat, I was using an aluminum one. It made a very loud ping, ping, ping noise every time it hit the rocks. Every time I hit the rocks. Then they would make a buzzing sound as they flew through the air until they landed. I could hear them really far. About an hour into hitting the rocks, I seen a huge Sasquatch walk into the open. It was directly in front of me and in the direction the rocks were flying. About 50 yards away. He walked from my left to my right from behind one juniper bush to the other juniper bush, never taking its eyes off of me. It was tall, like a Joshua tree. It walked past approximately, fifth, approximately 10 feet tall. I had just enough time to yell at Brian to turn around and look at this beast. He did and was so damn scared. We both were. I was struggling because I hadn't experienced that kind of fear before. This encounter was in bright daylight around 2 to 3 p.m. After it went behind the juniper bush to my right, I lost sight of it. Though we, could, though we soon realized it went straight to Scott's neighbor's house. We knew this because of the way the neighbor's dogs and chickens were carrying on. The dogs were literally crying in fear, and so were the chickens. It tore the chicken coop apart. Steve, we could hear it. Fearing for Scott's neighbors, we ran into his house and told his dad, Ray, what we saw. I didn't think he believed us, but the weirdest thing happened. His dad went into his room, grabbed a few guns, gave them to Scott, and told us to get into his van. We drove over to his neighbor's house, but luckily they weren't home, and the Sasquatch being was gone as well. But not before we got to see the damage we'd heard. Chicken wire, wooden poles, feathers, and blood were strewn everywhere. He killed a lot of chickens and took them all with him. The neighbor's dogs, four of them, were chained to steel posts and were all cowering in their dog houses. It didn't touch the dogs. My best friend Scott lives about a mile up towards the mountains than we did, and I'd often run and I'd often run home from his house at dusk and sometimes at night. The road I had to run home on was a dirt road about 12 feet wide, just barely enough room for two trucks to pass each other very slowly. It was full of rocks and pebbles. Even on that noisy running surface, I always knew when something was pacing me, but it did so from inside the tree line. I'd stop, it would stop, start, it would start, over and over. I never knew what it was because it didn't show itself until that aluminum bat incident. I had to go to Scott's very often after that, but it didn't matter. It knew where we lived and it would often look through our bedroom window as I told you earlier. There were four of us brothers, but my oldest brother Tony and I were the only ones to ever have a face-to-face -face experience with Sasquatches outside of our home. My scariest interaction was the time I witnessed a show of force by a large, approximately 10-foot male. I left our house and was walking around the corner of it towards a dirt road that leads to Scott's house. That's when the huge male started screaming at me and was trying to rip out a juniper tree. I could feel the noise he made, Steve. I froze scared shitless. What caught me by surprise is that he kept looking to his right, then back at me, and then to his right. That's when I noticed he was acting like this. To my left, moving away from the road I was walking towards, was a mother Sasquatch about seven to eight feet tall. She had her right arm around the shoulder slash back of a five foot tall, approximate adolescent. The mother Sasquatch had her left hand on her child's left wrist, and she was guiding her child away from the father and she was guiding her child away while the father was trying to distract me. I was so scared by what the large dad was doing that I couldn't move. But seeing the mom caring for her child, my belief, was enough to calm me. So I was finally able to get my body to run back into the house. That may sound weird, but my body... That may sound weird, but my body literally wouldn't listen to what I was telling it to do until I saw the mother and the child Sasquatch. To this day I have nightmares that the largest male chases me and gets his hand inside the door just in time to stop me from closing it. This, the action by the mother was so human to me that it changed the way I think of them. No longer apes or gorillas. We two species have a lot in common, I think. They might not be from this planet. 
I said that because the UFO sighting I had that gave me some of the same emotional connections I got from the Sasquatch sightings. I get you wanted to keep the Sasquatch and UFO topics separate for good cause. I pray all of us will get the answers we seek in regard to these beings sooner or later. Sooner than later. But my first sighting was in 1986, so for me it's going to be later than sooner. Keep fighting the good fight, brother. Aloha, Chris Miranda. Wow. And there's another one. There's another one about the male of the family unit being threatening. It's just amazing to me that they let you see them all just like that, right? I don't understand how they let us see them after while well, they outclass us so fiercely. I just don't get it. But we are. People are seeing them. Thousands, tens of, hundreds of thousands of people are having the same experiences, man. But anyway, on that note, I gotta get out of here. I need a shower. I need a shave. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a 180 of what I'm looking at right now because there's nothing else behind me but Hawaii or Japan or whatever. And I'm gonna show you guys what I'm seeing before I go, all right? And the beach that you're gonna see away in the distance is the beach that we've been on in the past and I made a couple videos, I think about a month ago. Thanks again for sending that, that email in, all right? Chris, and uh, you find any more missing pieces to your puzzle, make sure you share them here with everybody else too, all right? Or if you hear of anything that'll help help anyone, just send it my way and share it through me to everybody, all right? All right, so. That's where I came from, around that far point. It's looking towards Tofino, British Columbia. Pretty remote, isn't it? The west coast of Vancouver Island. That's the beach that we uh, that we go to. And I made a couple of videos right in that corner right there in the past. And this is where we catch the mighty spring salmon all along here. It's looking straight east. That's all the West Coast Trail along there, along that shoreline. Many people from around the world come and hiking. And that's all she that's all she wrote. That's looking south to Washington State, beyond those clouds. There we go. And that's where I am on the world today. And that's where I brought all of you with me.